Welcome in folks, I got a pretty dang cool video for you here today. We're gonna go through every single stock I own in this video and I'm gonna talk about them. We're also gonna go through all the stocks that I'm looking at buying, the risk reward profiles, which ones have the most insane upside, which ones have the biggest risk. We're gonna go through all that in this video. I thought this would just be a cool video to do on the channel here today because there's a lot of, I own so many stocks and there's always so much going on in the market. There's so many stocks to talk about that sometimes I won't talk about a stock for weeks or months on end, and I always see comments, hey, can you talk about this stock? Can you talk about that stock? What's your opinion on this stock? And those sorts of things. And so this is that video. We're going to go through it all. I hope you guys really enjoy this one. I'm sure you guys will. And uh, yeah, make sure you subscribe to the channel if you're not already subscribed, okay? So let's just start going through it, folks. Let's start at the top here. Let's go through the stocks I currently own, then we'll look at big tech in general, speak about all those. And then we're going to go through my other watch lists in general, speak about those stocks and specifically my possible buys watch list, which I need to change this. Actually, I need to rename this list to 2Q because uh, now we're actually in 2Q at now this point in time. Okay. So hope you guys enjoy this. Oh, by the way, holy smokes, this ain't no joke. I've got to let you guys know we're running out of time here, folks. We are now down to what? Five days left. Yeah. Five days until the deal. The one day sale for the Patreon tier that's usually 125 bucks is $69 for one day only. If you want access to that, check out the pinned comment down there, click on that, fill out your info, we'll send over the deal as soon as it drops that morning, okay? Access to my number one course ever, see the stocks I'm buying and selling each week, plus get access to that Discord chat, okay? So, the planet. Let's start out at the planet. It was an interesting day for the planet, huh? Hmm. So, the Planet, uh, I spoke about this stock extensively in yesterday's video, so I don't want to spend that much time talking about The Planet because there's a lot of stocks I haven't talked about in a while that I want to give my opinions on. But um, in terms of Planet, I think the business has bottomed. I think the stock has bottomed. I think it's just uh, a very good next few years for The Planet. I think the company's going to get back on the right track, and I think it's going to be a, you know, a stock that eventually gets out of the gulag, you know, which is a, it's a long way from the gulag. When you're 70 cents and you got to get to $5 plus, it's a long, long way. But we know that stock, it went from, a, you know, under a dollar to seven bucks in 14 months. It also went from seven bucks to a dollar in 14 months. So, you know, it's one of those sorts of stocks. But yeah, I spoke about that extensively in yesterday's video. Revolve stock. So first off, Revolve. Okay. Listen, listen, listen. This stock is set up very well for this year, very well. And the reason being, they are cash loaded with no debt. And we know interest rates are gonna be high this entire year, so they're gonna be able to make a lot of interest income and they don't have to worry about interest expense because their balance sheet's in such a great position, right? We also know this this company has cake-like uh, cake comps to comp against on a year over year basis, which is very important for stock price in the short term. You wanna, you in the short term, you wanna see a company comp against numbers from the previous year and beat those numbers, beat those numbers, beat those numbers, right? And so Revolve is set up very well for this year. Also, it looks like clothing sales are gonna be in a much better place likely this year than they were, let's say, last year. And so Revolve, I think, is set up really, really well. I'm really excited about this one. And um, yeah, th this stock, it gets put in the small cap category. It kind of gets that disrespect, but this is, let's be honest, this is one of the safer business models you can find out there because of their balance sheet. And they also have remained, they've remained in a great uh, position overall in terms of their bottom line as well, which is fascinating because they've actually made some substantial changes with return policy at Revolve that's really hurt the company's financials in the short term, but it's the type of stuff that will win customers long term, okay? So Revolve, I actually really like the setup for the short term, but I really like that one for the long term. Elf on a shelf. So this one has fallen recently. This is silly. This is so flippin' flapjack and silly. The fact that this stock fell from that $200 level here recently down to 170 is, is pretty laughable in my opinion. It all happened because Ulta came out and said sales of overall cosmetics products in their business was a little slower. But what's that got to do with Elf at the end of the day, right? Um, there's many brands out there and maybe those some of those brands, some of those prestige brands aren't doing very well. So maybe Ulta used to sell a product for 40 bucks, and now that person's trading down to an Elf product that's priced at eight bucks, right? Or $10. So for Ulta, that really hurts their business. For Elf, it's a huge benefit. So until we see something in Elf's numbers, to drop this stock like that is silly, absolutely silly. Tesla, my Esla. Obviously, it hasn't been a great year, but 
The stock has shown some life recently. It bought them, you know, mid-March around 162, and then we've headed up from there. But overall, in regards to Tesla, I can't see it getting any more negative than it's gotten over the past month. I, I think things only get more positive for Tesla from here on out. And so I think that's pretty good overall. And yeah, August 8th, obviously, huge day, huge day for the company. The robo taxi is going to get shown off. Now, people, it's so funny, man. You know, robo taxi, right? I was telling people for years, it's likely going to be a two door vehicle. And uh, now, and, and everybody back then was like, no, no way. They're not going to do two doors. No, no, no. The Model 2 and Robo Taxi. No, no, no. And now all of a sudden, the, all the rumors I'm starting to see and hear out there are that it's going to be a two door vehicle, right? With two seats in it. And that just makes the most sense. Most people, the far majority of people, you can have other robo taxis out there as well that maybe, you know, could fit four or five people in the vehicle if you need to, right? Or even eight people. But for most people, it doesn't make sense. It's not practical. You like, It's one person needs to go from here, from their work down to the coffee shop over there, and then to that restaurant, and then back home, right? Like, that's most people, it's one or two people. Drive on any highway in the United States of America and look inside the cars, Make sure you have it on full self-driving before you start looking at other people's cars when you're on the highway, okay? Look in the cars. Tell me how many people are in those cars. One person. Maybe two people. We have the HOV lane here in Vegas. I know in Phoenix, when I lived there, we had an HOV lane. I don't think we had one in Charlotte, North Carolina when I was living out there. But um, HOV lane, you got to have two people or more, right? Not many people can ride that lane. How come? Because most people, it's one person in the car. So you, they don't even have a second person, the far majority of people. So it's just funny how that's all working, right? But Tesla, you know, I think the story gets better from here. It's going to, they're obviously going to report a disappointing quarter, but everybody knows it now. All that matters is Elon Musk just has to say margins are going up in the back half of the year and we're off to the moon, okay? That's all he's got to say. No, if he doesn't say that, and there's still worries about margins getting hit worse, I mean, then we're in a different situation, right? We could go back down to like 150, 160. Fubo, I mean, if you want to talk about a ridiculous potential upside stock, I mean, Fubo is that stock, right? It comes with risks. They've been losing a lot of money. They're bringing down those losses substantially, right? The, everything in the business is moving the right way. Revenues, the amount of customers they have, right? Their average revenue per customer, their losses are bringing those down, margins are increasing. Every single metric you want to look at for Fubo is all getting better, right? But with that being said, it's still a fairly risky stock because they haven't got to profitability. Well, in the next one to two years, they could get to profitability. And if you keep bringing down these losses, you keep adding more customers and more revenue, the likelihood that you're going to eventually get to a situation where this company is just you know, making money on that bottom line, this stock will see, you know, 10, 15, 20 dollars a share very quickly. And it'll be kind of one of those life changing stocks. So we'll see. I think it's I think it's a pretty good situation. If interest rates drop, it's gonna help out Fubo tremendously. Tremendously. If small caps go on a big run this year, it's gonna help out Fubo tremendously. There's so many things that could help Fubo and so many things that I don't think can hurt Fubo now at this point in time. So the fact that this stock has sold off this much this year, I think is going to be a huge mistake in the end. A huge mistake in the end. SoFi. So SoFi Technologies also had a, a you know a rough start to the year, down about 18%. There's a newer stock that I've owned, right? Newer, very, very new position relative. It might be my newest stock I've bought, right? SoFi. Whew. So SoFi is interesting. They're undercutting. They're undercutting a lot of competition right now. How are they undercutting competition and how are they stealing away customers from a lot of other big players? I'll explain to you. What SoFi is doing very interesting is they're undercutting competition in terms of savings account interest rates. Now, it's not a great place to have a savings account if you just want to do one big lump sum and try to collect a 5% number on that. But for the masses... If you set up direct deposit, you can access that, that savings account rate and get that savings account. So for the masses, it actually makes a lot of sense. For somebody like myself that just wants to drop a million dollars in there, right, or whatever, half million, a hundred thousand dollars, whatever, it's not actually ideal. You need to basically to get the highest interest rate from SoFi as far as savings, you need to basically either have five thousand dollars a month go through, which is just pain in the butt to set that up, or you have to have direct deposit. So, but for the masses, it makes sense, right? Now the other way SoFi is stealing away customers, in my opinion, is a lot of people have credit card debt. We know this, right? 
Credit card debt, those interest rates are insane. I mean, we're talking about 20%, 25%, 30% type interest rates on credit card debt. So what SoFi is doing is allowing people to take out personal loans. If you have pretty good credit and you have, you know, you've proven over time you can pay back your loans and your debts and those sorts of things. What SoFi is doing is they might charge you 12%, give you a personal loan. Now you go ahead and use that personal loan to pay off that credit card. So let's say you got $8,000 in credit card debt and you're like, I'm, I'm paying this ridiculous interest rate. I'm paying 24%. And then SoFi is there offering you 12% APY, right? Um, in terms of what you have to pay. So now all of a sudden you're looking and you're like, okay, I pay 24% interest rate or 12% interest rate. There's a dramatic difference there, right? And so you take out a SoFi loan, right? You go pay that credit card off and then you pay SoFi, right? You pay them the 12% interest in your, your principal over time. So obviously it's taking risk on SoFi's part, which is the business of banking. It's taking risk, right? I mean, that's just, there's just no other way of doing it. Like that's business, that's banking, right? You're taking risk. You want to give somebody a mortgage, it's taking a level of risk, right? You want to give somebody a car loan, taking a level of risk, personal loan, it's all risk, right? But for SoFi, and also it's an, it's an interesting way to attract more customers over, right? And then hopefully they can give somebody that personal loan and then they attract them into their checking account product, savings account. And then over time, they sell them the other million products that SoFi has over time. So I like SoFi. Obviously, if a major recession were to hit, it would hurt SoFi. There's no doubt about that, right? Like it's just, there's no other way around that. If there was a, some sort of massive recession, it would really hurt SoFi. The thing I like is it sounds like Anthony Noto is really taking a very, very prudent approach in terms of not taking too much risk for SoFi. So I like that overall. Nike has had a horrible start to the year for them, right? If, you know, 14, 15% down. This is a steel deal. Easy money, easy money. If you want to give me easy money, give me Nike shares under 100 bucks. That's easy money, okay? All day long. All day long, baby. I mean, you know, all day long. Easy money. I spoke about Nike in my seven stocks I was buying uh, video, which came out, when did that come out? Uh, a couple weeks ago, right? April edition. And then I also spoke about it in March as well. And this is a stock I bought seven straight weeks in the public account, I believe. Seven straight weeks. So you don't get me putting money into a stock seven straight weeks unless there's really something. There's, you know, if the risk reward profile is that attractive, you're going to see me buy, buy, buy. And, and as long as Nike's under $100, I'm going to continue to buy and add more shares and more shares and more shares. Some guy just went by on a sweet golf cart, man. That thing had those big rims on it. It's like baller golf carts, not like one of those regular golf carts. It was like a baller golf cart. PayPal. PayPal. So I spoke about PayPal on today's video on the reaction channel. Jeremy LaFave makes money if you don't follow me on there. Okay. And PayPal. Easy money. Easy money. Easy money. The, the thing with PayPal is the valuation is just so darn attractive. That's what makes – there's two core things, I would say, that make PayPal such an attractive stock. One is the forward P, right? The forward P on this stock is insanely low. This is a beta. No one has access to this except me right now. Um, you know, PayPal trading at 12 times forward PE. Peg ratio 0.79 on this baby. You know, that sort of net margin on this company. Like, come on. Come on. So, it's just a no-brainer. You know, you just look at all the metrics. It's a no-brainer stock. And and the other great thing with, with PayPal is we're talking about a company here that... We're, we're talking about a company that you... Where where my other thing go? Here it is, trading view. We're talking about a company in which they have a diversified business model. This isn't just a one-trick pony. If this was just PayPal and you got nothing else, ooh, it might not be as interested. Or if it was a trading at a different valuation. The fact that they get PayPal and Venmo and Braintree, like, oh my gosh. And some of the, one of the interesting things I was speaking about on the reaction channel here today in regards to PayPal that I don't think gets talked about nearly enough in regards to a stock is Braintree product is going to be incredibly sticky over time. If you're a big company, right, and you use Braintree for all your back end of running transactions as well as the other, you know, services Braintree can give you, 
I think it's, why would you go ahead and replace them? You wouldn't. Anybody that's a business owner out there, you know, like if you've got to run transactions, you just want something that works great, is seamless, easy for customers. And once it's there, it's there. And you're not really interested in anything else unless that other, whatever it is, is bad, right? If you have issues with that, they cause you problems, then you start looking for alternatives. But Braintree, from my understanding, people love that and they continue to use it for years and years and years. So I think Braintree is going to be incredibly sticky and, you know, some app starts using Braintree as a small company and they end up becoming a big company like an Uber or whatever, right? They're going to DoorDash, whoever, right? They're going to continue to use them, you know, 10 years in the future, 20 years in the future. And maybe at first PayPal was only running a small amount of transactions. And then over time, those small amount of transactions ran into a lot of transactions, right? So another thing with PayPal they're buying back a ridiculous amount of shares. They're talking about buying at least $5 billion worth of stock back this year. It's insane. And so, I mean, this isn't even like some huge market cap company in, in regards to PayPal, right? $60, $70 billion type market cap. And they're talking about buying at least $5 billion worth of shares back. You know what that's going to do to the earnings per share of this company? And then, do you think they're only going to buy shares this year? Probably not. They're probably going to buy a bunch more shares back next year. In the following year as well. You know why? Because PayPal generates massive cash flow. And I don't see that stopping anytime soon. Remember, this is still a company that is expected to grow and grow and grow. So, whew, you know, I, I love I love that I've been able to buy PayPal stock so cheap. And I love the, that the company has been able to buy the stock so cheap. It's, an, it's amazing, right? Shopify, Shopify, Shopify. Stock has gone absolutely nowhere which should be seen as a blessing, a blessing for everybody out there. I created a video probably two months ago on the channel now. It might be two months ago, it might be three months ago. I think it was two months ago. And I created this video, it was called Buy Shopify Stock and Don't Stop. And it was probably a 30 minute presentation I gave in regards to Shopify Stock and where I see this business model going over the coming years and just, oh my gosh. It's just a no-brainer. I mean, it's one of those stocks I just feel like you got to have in your in a portfolio. you got to have it in a portfolio. You're just not to own Shopify seems like just a bad decision, a bad financial decision overall. It's no different than not owning Amazon over the years, right? One of my big regrets in the stock market is not buying Amazon a lot sooner. I wish I would have started buying Amazon stock a lot sooner than when I started buying it. Did they just buy a Tesla over there? Or is that like a friend going to see them? Oh, one of my neighbors might have got a Tesla. So that would be Tesla, Tesla, Tesla. And then if that's their new car across the street, another Tesla. Exciting. What was I talking about? What stock we were talking Shopify. Watch that video if you need me to go in depth on Shopify. Buy Shopify stock and don't stop. It's a no-brainer. you got to have in your portfolio. One of my big regrets was definitely not buying Amazon earlier in my investing lifespan. Wind Resorts, steel deal, steel deal. Macau's still coming back. People don't even understand. Like Macau's still not even back to like 2019 levels. It's starting to get there. But in regards to win, there's so much upside here. Vegas continues to put up great numbers. Vegas is in a better position than they've ever been in because we're attracting so much conference business, so much convention business, so much, um, you know, like big year round events. We now have big sports teams here. So Vegas has just been a, in a much better, stronger position than we've ever seen it at in its history by far, right? So that makes me much more confident in Vegas when the next recession hits versus how, with the, the situation they were in, the great financial crisis. We're talking about they're building a property in the Middle East right now, which is kind of, oh my gosh, there's so much freaking money in the Middle East. You have no idea. It's insane. Um, and, and guess what? That big money that's in the Middle East, that, those are exactly wins type customers. And so phew, get ready to have your knock, socks knocked off when, when those numbers hit, which that's still years away. So don't get too excited about that. But for now, this is really a Vegas story, a Macau story. Then it's going to become a Middle East story as well which that might be the most interesting opportunity I've seen since Las Vegas Sands opened Marina Bay Sands, Singapore. I don't know if you guys know about that property. It's an incredible property. They opened probably, that might be 15 years ago now or so. Um, you know, if I was going to Singapore, that's exactly where I'm staying. Marina Bay Sands, incredible property. And uh, this might be the most interesting opportunity I've seen on the worldwide stage since that property opened. And um, it's going to be so exciting. Win, I think we'll win New York City. I think they're going to win that Manhattan project in the Hudson Yards. It's possible they don't. New York City could screw that up, but if it, you know, 
So there's so much going on with Wynn that's so positive for this company that I just love it. I just love it. And the customer base, the customer base always has freaking money. You know, everybody worries about recession, these sorts of things. I understand. Little money is not big money to win. I, I, I could have, I have so many stories I could tell you guys about the win. And listen, man, if you drop, I know people that have dropped nearly a million dollars at the win in a weekend. And those people were not even considered a whale. A million, imagine dropping a million dollars at win. Losing a million dollars, that is. Okay, not just gambling through. I'm talking about losing a million dollars. And you're not even a big time whale. Like it's not even like they, you know, they might, they'll comp you a nice room and those sorts of things and give you some free meals. But it's not even like you're the big dog. And you drop a million dollars. Like almost any other property, that would be like insane. You know, you're going to throw you the biggest uh, whatever. Million dollars at the win, that's just, you're just a, you're just a decent player, right? And so the little money, it's not really win. Wins, wins worried about the people that, you know, have hundreds of millions of dollars net worth, billions of dollars, because those people are gambling on whole different levels, right? They're gambling in private rooms when they come to the win in the encore, and that's who they attract. So the moral of the story is wins customer base always has money, man, always has money, big money. And that's in Asia and that's in the United States, right? And obviously a lot of Europeans come to the win either in Macau, but a lot of them come to Vegas. So a lot of that big European money, when they come to game, they go to win, okay? Amazon, so amazing on stock, man, it's been treating me well, it's treating me well. You know, this has just been an easy money stock, continues to be an easy money stock. Like, like the thing with Amazon is, it's just like, they have, they have a bunch of different businesses they own. They own Amazon, they own Amazon Web Service, they got the advertising business, they have Twitch, they own Twitch, if you didn't know. They own Whole Foods, they own Zappos, they own so many different businesses, it's insane, right? But... The three core businesses, tell me when these businesses stop growing. The e-commerce business, when does it stop growing? I don't know. I don't want to make that prediction. There's no time soon, right? When, no pun intended, when does the advertising business stop growing? Oh my gosh, that's so long from now, I can't even see it. Are you kidding me? The advertising business is a baby for Amazon compared to their e-commerce business. That's got it infinite growth for such a long time. AWS, when does AWS stop growing? That's so long from now, it's hard to even see. And in regards to the cloud business, I mean, they got, there's several companies that try to compete there, but there's one other serious competitive threat. And it's obviously the Azure product that, that Microsoft has, right? But at the end of the day, Amazon's a big dog. They got the majority of the market share. And in cloud, these companies are starting to focus on profits. So you're going to stop seeing such a... So like, for instance, Uber and Lyft. Uber and Lyft were, were fine with losing money for years and years. And they battled over market share and battled over market share. Those days are over for Uber and Lyft, right? Now they're focused on profits, profitability, margins. The same thing's going on in the cloud business right now. So in the cloud business, these companies for the last decade plus have really been fighting over market share. And it's just about generating revenue to generate revenue, right? And trying to get people into their cloud ecosystem. Those days are starting to leave now. Google's starting to focus on profitability for the cloud division. Microsoft is obviously, and Amazon is as well, right? Because these can be cash cow businesses. And so the days of really fighting over 1% or 2% market share, I think at this point in time, are done. And now these companies are going to focus on profits, which is going to benefit who the most? It benefits Amazon the most. Because think about it. If you're the biggest big dog, right, and there's a there's a price war, you're the biggest dog is the one that gets hit the most. It's math. It's just simple math. Think about it logically for a moment. Math, right? If you're the biggest company and everybody lowers their price, so let's say you have 10 burger chain restaurants around a city, right? <clears throat> there's a price war for burgers. And the burger shop that only has one store, they make all 10 of your stores have to lower price. You're the one that gets hit way more because you have 10 stores out there, right? And so now when things flip and it's not about market share anymore and it's about profitability, now suddenly you're the one that benefits the most. So this is why Amazon will be the one to benefit the most from kind of getting out of this price war that these companies have been in for at least the last five, 10 years in regards to the cloud. And so that's another thing to factor in in a massive way in regards to Amazon. So with Amazon, right? <clears throat> when does the growth stop? When does the growth stop for Amazon? I don't know, but it's no time soon. 
And I understand it's not the cheapest stock in the world, right? I get it. I get it. Uh, you know, 44 times forward P. First thing to keep in mind, that might not be accurate. That might be way low. I mean, excuse me, way, way high. They might be, they might, they're pro. What do we know about Amazon? They come in, they destroy their numbers. They destroy your earnings. So, you know, this is compiling, obviously, analyst estimates. They might actually be at like a 38 or 37 times. You might say, okay, that's still like double the market. Is Amazon going to grow double the market in terms of revenue and EPS growth over the next five, 10 years? Do you think it's only going to be double? Of course not. They're going to grow like five, 10 times the average revenue growth rate of an average stock in EPS growth, right? So for, you know, getting it at 40 something times is actually a steel deal in regards to the stock overall, right? And we know Amazon has so much room, so much flip and flapjack and room for margin expansion over the coming years. It's ridiculous. And profitability expansion, jeez, jeez. So in regards to Amazon, always a steel dealer balance sheet's getting a better place than ever, right? Cheesecake Factory has done a whole lot of nothing this year so far as far as the stock price goes, right? I mean, it's gone nowhere. This is a stock that is just waiting. When the Russell starts making that move, watch out. Whenever the Russell, whenever the Russell finally wants to wake up, which the Russell's been stuck in kind of like this 2K range, right? Like it's been stuck between 2000 and 2100, it feels like for like 100 years now at this point in time. When the Russell finally makes that move, cake's going to 60, 70 bucks, quick. There's another one that trades at, you know, ridiculously cheap valuations. I mean, it's insane. Cake trades at, I think 11 times this year's expected numbers. Yeah, 11 forward P on the stock, a peg ratio 0.59. Oh, oh. Oh my gosh. The net margin number, I think, is going to increase pretty dramatically over this next one to two years because they finally have really started to catch up on, on pricing. I mean, oh my gosh. North Italia, it, the growth rates. Uh, I think once people start to understand the story better at Cake, I think there's a lot of people that just are very uneducated on Cake. And this is a problem with the stock market a little bit right now. Because of the indexification of the market, I'll call it that. A lot of people have gotten very complacent about actually researching companies, actually looking to see what's going on with those companies, right? And so <clears throat> in the short term, we have companies trade at very cheap valuations and people, I bet you, I bet you, if I went to New York City right now and I grabbed <clears throat> the 100 biggest hedge fund managers, I bet you they have no freaking clue on what's going on with the Cheesecake Factory. I bet you if I... I had them all sit in a room and I said, talk to me about Cheesecake Factory stock. And I had the 100 biggest hedge fund managers in the world, or, or let's just say New York City, all right there, which they're all pretty much in New York City, right? And I said, talk to me about Cheesecake Factory stock. They're going to look at me and be like, um, I don't really know much. Uh, they own the Cheesecake Factory? You think they're going to talk to me about North Italia and the comps out of North Italia? You think they're going to talk to me about Flower Child and the growth rates that company's going to have and how many sort of growing units? Do you think they have any idea? No, they don't have no clue. They're just like, uh, S&P 500 index fund, uh, how do I keep up with the market, uh, AI, big tech, uh, NVIDIA, they're, gonna, they're not going to have anything for me, okay? And so this is a kind of a problem, but it's a problem in the short term, but for the long term, for long term investors, it gives us the most incredible opportunities because we get to buy stocks that are under the radar at ridiculously cheap valuations that we would never have a chance to get if people understood what was going on here. If hedge funds knew about Cheesecake Factory in, in North Italia and the Fox Restaurant concepts, they don't even know what I'm even talking about right now. They're completely clueless. If they knew about all that, they'd be jumping all over the stock. And, and instead of being able to buy it in the 30s, I'd have to buy it in the 60s or 90s right now. They will see it over time as those numbers pour in, as the story gets told more and more over the next 5, 10 years. And once it eventually gets an SP500 and all those sorts of things. But in the short term... You know, they have no clue what the heck's going on there. And that's fine, right? Because it just allows, like I said, long-term investors, us that actually pay attention to what's going on inside business models, be able to identify those. Because we know over the long term, great companies will get rewarded for that, right? You know, if we went back 10, 15 years ago, I guarantee you a lot of people didn't know about Chipotle. They had no clue. And now, a days, people are running over themselves to buy Chipotle stock, right? That's just, that's just how it is. Nordstrom. So Nordstrom's actually a stock I've thought about selling recently. 
I own some shares in a, an account of this one, not because obviously Nordstrom's a great company, but the stock's gone up recently on the back of some rumors that they could be for sale. So I don't know, I might stay in it for a bit. I'm not necessarily a rush to get out of it, but if there's some sort of deal announced, let's say there's some deal comes out and the family's trying to buy the company back or some PE company's trying to buy it for $30 a share or something like that. And let's say it shot to $26, $27 the next day, I would just go ahead and get out of it in that situation. So, but Nordstrom is a really good company overall, but there's a decent probability this could be taken private for some sort of premium price in the next, I would say, 12 months. So we'll see what happens with that. Meta, obviously, tremendous year. It's up about 50% so far this year, right? And, you know, the most beautiful thing with Meta stock, the most beautiful thing with Meta stock, right? Look at this. Look at this, okay? It's beautiful. 25, 25 forward PE? Come on, man. Come on. It's Meta. It's Meta we're talking about here. 25 with a growth rate of 20% plus expected for this year, right? I mean, that's insane. That's literally insane. This company should be trading easily in the 30s as far as a forward P right now. The fact that it's trading where it's trading for this stock, I'll take that all day. The stock's still a steel deal. It's not as much a steel deal as the one day tax break steal. Is it? No, but it's a steel deal, man. And so Meta stock, it's still a buy. You know, this stock's a buy all the way to 1,000. And don't be surprised if you see a thousand, you know, sooner rather than later in regards to that one. Texas Rodas had a tremendous year. No, Texas Rodas is a stock I've considered selling. I've considered selling it. I haven't yet, but I've considered it. It's had an incredible run this year. It's had an incredible run over the years. It's one of the most well-run companies in the world. No doubt about that. And I'm not just talking about restaurant industry. I'm talking about period. Incredible company. Uh, but the thing with Texas Roadhouse is we're talking about a company, right, that trades at a forward P similar to like Meta, but I don't think they have that sort of revenue growth ahead that a company like Meta has. And also, the other thing I've considered is I can get I can get cake at less than half this valuation, right? In terms of the forward P, less than half. And is cake as safe? Well, yes and no. Cake doesn't have as good of a balance sheet as Roadhouse because Roadhouse has eliminated all debt now, so that they're just cash loaded, right, with no debt. But the thing that's a little dangerous for Texas Roadhouse, they're so reliant on the Texas Roadhouse brand, where Cheesecake is now emerging into a very diversified business where you've got the Cheesecake Factory, right? But then you also have North Italia that's going to grow into a giant over this next five years. And you have, uh, you have Flower Child that's going to grow into a giant over this next five years. Texas Roadhouse, the other con uh, concepts, Jaggers and Bubba's 33, I'm just not sure those are going to grow into giants. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just not, um, to be honest. So... I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. But maybe I maybe I cash at some point. Avon had a tough year. I think this one's kind of in the, the planet category in terms of is it a bottoming out phase right now? Things get better from here. And um, we'll see. We'll see. You know, as our, Norton's got to get the... The thing is, Norton, the guy who runs the company, he's got to get the bottom line. I'm talking net income positive, quarter in and quarter out. If he can do that... It's a game changer for Avon. He's got to do that, though. We don't want to see non-gap numbers, blah, blah, blah. We don't want to see adjusted EBITDA. Investors want to see positive net income. They want to see real money being made. If they can start to see that, then Avon can become a consistently, not just good top-line grower, but bottom-line grower, eh, stock, next thing you know, would be a dollar a share. But he's got to prove that out, right? Got to get to net, I mean, that would be incredible. If Avon could get to net income positive every quarter, watch out. Watch out. Palantir. Palantir's had a decent year so far, up 37%. I think that's a little better than decent. I mean, if you can get 37% a year on a stock, you've, you've found a winner, winner, chicken dinner. But yeah, 30%, 7% so far this year. Palantir, what a time to be cash loaded, right? What a time. I mean, you think about you think about one of the best times in the past 20 plus years to be cash loaded. It's right now when interest rates, you can get this sort of money on treasuries and Palantir is able to generate that money and with no debt. I mean, tremendous. And then you think about, I mean, Palantir is really, 
they either got insanely lucky. This is the way you got to view Palantir. It's either one of the luckiest companies in the world, or they really do have a mad scientist genius running this company. It's one of those two. I don't care which which take you have on it, but it, you can't have any other take other than this mad scientist genius running the company, or they're just the luckiest freaking people in the world. Because you think about it. They went into this whole situation cash loaded with no debt in one of the best times in history to be cash loaded with no debt when all of a sudden interest rates went to the moon, right? On top of that, the company has been focused for the past 10, 20 years on building a product that is so great that's at the cross sections of data and artificial intelligence. And now we're in this massive AI wave where every company out there is looking for AI related solutions to improve their businesses. And oh, there's just Palantir here with this perfect product, right? And with everything they, they have from AIP, the Foundry, Gotham, Apollo, all their products, it's just so well positioned. And so you got to ask yourself, and then the third thing is, CARP years ago told us about the world we were about to move into, which was going to be much more conflict, much more geopolitical problems, going to move into a much da- more dangerous world. He told us this years ago. And everything he said came true. So, I take you back. Is Palantir the luckiest company in the world and everything just happens to work out for them and just everything? Or do they actually have a mad scientist genius run the company? Ask yourself that, right? Because there's no in-between here, folks. There's no in-between. I'm going to go with the... They might have a mad scientist genius run the company because I don't think all these things all working out happens to just be by luck or by coincidence. I think there's some stuff there, okay? And so that's Palantir. And it also, by the way, pays very handsomely when, you know, you're one of the most trusted companies in the world by the U.S. government because you probably know a lot of stuff that a lot of other people don't know, even a lot of politicians. Mattel? Do I even still own Mattel? I don't even know if I still own Mattel. I'm going to have to check. Uh, Mattel, they've had a very positive change in the business model recently, though. I will say with that, with obviously the Barbie movie was a game changer for them. I think they got a Hot Wheels movie coming. And uh, so they could form into like a Disney type company because they own all those different toy brands. But then on top of that, they have this movie component to it. Could end up forming into like a like a Disney type opportunity and licensing from that. It's pretty exciting. NVIDIA, come on, man. It's a must-own stock. It's a must-own stock. This dip here, give me a break. That's just some short-term traders trading in and out of the stock. At the end of the day, everybody's going to want to own this. Until NVIDIA's growth rates break, and when I say break, I'm talking about such a big deceleration in growth that people really get scared. Until that happens with NVIDIA, the stock's going to keep rolling. It's going to be 1000 plus before you know it, and then people are going to be paying 1500 for the stock. And then they're going to be having a conversation about, man, maybe NVIDIA wasn't that expensive when it was 800 But here's the deal. 37 Ford P. And we really haven't seen anybody to really compete with NVIDIA's chips yet. A lot of these other players try to show off this and that. At the end of the day, there's still no one really competing with NVIDIA's chips. So until we see that, also, it's a hard one not to be very, very excited about. It really is. So in regards to NVIDIA, it's positioned great for this AI wave. And when does this end? Who knows? Honest. So it's had a pretty decent start to the year. The six months, crazy on this one. Look at this six month, 217% gain. That's insane. That's insane. Had a pullback here recently, but don't be surprised if this baby heads back up to five plus. When I look at Honest, honestly, I'm very impressed. Carla's doing a heck of a job running that company. Uh, She's now got the numbers all headed in the right direction. I'm talking revenue, I'm talking margins, I'm talking bottom line. It's all, and then when we're about to get into my possible buys list, and then we'll talk big tech as well. I mean, my gosh, she's got it all. She's got it all going in the right direction. The fear of bankruptcy and those sorts of things are gone now, because now the balance sheet's in a really good place. And if we're talking about actually getting a profitability, it's going to help this company even, even more. So all the fear that there was in this company... It's gone now. It's gone. So it's honestly in a great position. I'm the most bullish I've been on the stock in years in terms of actually feeling good about it. And it's because of the numbers. And it's not just because of like, 
I feel like a certain way. I feel like this. No, it's because of numbers. It's getting out of the gulag. It's getting out of the gulag probably in the next six months. It's getting out of the gulag in the next six months likely. If the Russell goes on a roll, 10 bucks soon. But that's, that's if the Russell goes on a roll, a roll soon. We're going over 10. But in the shorter term, we're getting out of this gulag. We're going over five. And um, I'm just happy. I'm just happy. I'm just, I don't know what else to say about it. I'm just happy they got to that place. Because we've been let down by some of these small caps. you know. But the honest looks like it. Carla's job and that, that Amazon experience is all paying off handsomely. right? Safety stocks. Is there anything that really is compelling to me there? No. Although I will say, by the way, in regards to dollar dollar stores, it's actually going to get less competitive because like the 99 cent stores are all going out right now. So, yeah, there's that going on. Um, as far as these other watch lists go, I'm probably just going to focus on my first quarter 2024 possible buys. Well, now it's second quarter. I need to rename that. How do I rename that list? Can I do it here? How do I rename this list here? There we go. Rename. We're changing it right now. 2Q possible buys. There we go. Okay, so guess I don't know why I had that one on there. It is a good company, but I have no interest in actually buying guess. Uh, maybe one night, I think one day I was researching. I was like, oh, I like what's guess is going on here. Okay, let's start out at the top. RH. No, no. Mm-mm. No. No. I mean, the thing with RH, they've done a lot of things that have kind of made me frustrated. The, the, main, the main thing, the main hair I'm holding against RH right now is the way Gary spent almost all the freaking money that was on the balance sheet on that buyback. I just thought that was a really poor decision at that particular time. And did it pump the stock in the short term? Sure. But at the end of the day, no. No, no, no. And in regards to high-end housing, I've, I'm seeing no... Proof points at high-end housing, which is RH's customer base, is really getting in a better position right now, right? I'm seeing no signs of that. So it still seems like we need to have a reset before RH can really start going in the right direction. For real, for real. It does these fake pump outs. But look at this. You know, it had that massive epic move up to nearly $350 a share, right? Just to give it all back. This is a stock I'm not afraid will run away from me. And also, let's say hypothetically the market has some sort of big pullback. Where do you think RH stock's going? It's going back under 200. Let's say hypothetically, and that's not even, I'm not even talking about a big pullback. I'm just talking about 5 to 7% S&P. 5 to 7% down in the S&P likely means RH is going under 200. If we have a 10, 15, 20% pullback in the RH, then maybe we're talking about 150 or so, right? So... I think it's it's still got a lot of risk there. I'm not not ready to make a move there, right? Tesla, I spoke about Tesla earlier. Alibaba. The problem with Alibaba, you know, something that scared me on Alibaba recently was on the Nike conference call. So on the Nike conference call recently, they were talking about China growth and they were talking about a, a service, I cannot remember the specific name of the service, but it's been growing rapidly in China. And they were, they were excited because they're about to get on there. And they specifically cited Tmall having very weak growth, right? So which means they're likely losing customers over this other platform. So, you know, there might be some actual real fundamental problems with Alibaba's business model. And so, you know, I got in the stock for a little bit and then I got out and I'm still kind of keeping an eye on it. I don't know. I'm a little worried. I'll be honest with you guys. After hearing that specific commentary on the Nike conference call, right? Zoom, 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 zoom stock. Then about 7% or so. Zoom, one of the best balance sheets you'll ever find in the stock market, right? And what a, once again, what a great time to be having no debt and having, you know, a, a massive cash load, which is what Zoom does. And the other thing that's compelling about Zoom is a stock trades very, very cheap. It trades very, very cheap if we pull up Zoom here, right? I mean, it's incredibly cheap. Um, 12 point, 12, you know, 12.8 forward PE. Peg ratio of 0.54. That's one of the lowest you'll find out there. And obviously great net margins, great gross margins for this company. Obviously, this is not an exciting growth company anymore, right? Next year's, you know, if you look at kind of growth rates here, 3 and 6% put me to sleep. But when we're talking about a company in which 
you know, for Zoom, I mean, at that sort of 4P with that sort of balance sheet, it's pretty compelling, actually. So I never thought the day I would even consider buying Zoom stock, but I'm considering it. We'll see. We'll see. It would add a nice kind of, it would be a kind of a nice B2B type play for my portfolios. It would add good balance, but I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Google McDougal. I don't think I'm buying Google. This one is Callaway Top Golf. It made a massive run here recently, which makes me likely not interested anymore. Nike, obviously, I spoke about that. PayPal, Shopify, I spoke about those. Whirlpool's gone on a little bit of a run here recently. Now, Whirlpool's somewhat interesting to me. And the reason being is we've had a stale real estate market for what has seemed like the longest time, right? The real estate market has been so stale. Homes are moving. Why are they not moving? People are locked in at very low interest rates, 2 and 3%. If you want to go get a mortgage right now, you're looking somewhere around the ballpark of 7%. And so people just aren't moving, right? And if you look at existing home sales, the numbers are astronomically low. I mean, we're talking about existing home sale numbers are back at like, gosh, they're back at like great financial crisis type numbers. That's how bad it is right now, right? So... The moral of the story is, I don't see it getting much worse from here in terms of um, existing home sales, right? If anything, I think things will slowly improve over the next few years. I do not think we're going to have a snapback in terms of everybody's going to be moving suddenly. I think it's going to be a slow, gradual kind of things get better starting in the back half of this year and then kind of move on in future years, right? And so I think that would likely benefit somebody like a Whirlpool. And that's why I'm considering potentially getting in the stock. Because you got to understand this stock is at multi, you know, not at those lows right now, but it's near multi-year lows. If we pull up a five-year chart of this stock, I mean, recently this stock was kind of trading at $100, $105. In the Rona crash, it got all the way down to the 70s, right? But that was pretty unrealistic. But, you know, if we back this baby all the way up, right? Let's just look at kind of the past, we can call it decade or so for the company. For the past decade, so let's go back to like kind of 2014-ish, I mean, the stock's trading about as cheap as it's traded in the entire last decade, right? And so with a Whirlpool stock, I don't see it getting that much worse. Obviously, if you threw a recession at us in the next 12 months, could it get worse for Whirlpool? Could it go under 100? Sure, if you threw that at it. But if you threw a recession, the other good thing for Whirlpool is guess what's going to happen? Mortgage rates are going to go down massively. So if mortgage rates went down massively then that ultimately would end up benefiting Whirlpool. People would start positioning into Whirlpool because there would be understanding that the housing market's going to start seeing more inventory move. And when you get people moving, they're much more likely to buy a new washer, dryer, uh, refrigerator, whatever it is, right? So we'll see. We'll see what goes on with that. No, somebody did say, and they brought up a good point in regards to Whirlpool recently. They said, with all these homes being built, so many homes being built, you know, home building numbers have still been tremendous. Why isn't Whirlpool benefiting from that? Well, they are benefiting a little bit, but home builders can probably negotiate very well, right? Because they're, they're, they're selling a mass project. And so my thought process is the margins aren't going to be as attractive when you're selling to a home builder as selling to somebody, you know, on a website or selling to somebody in a store or something like that. Because the home builders are likely commanding extremely competitive pricing because they could probably put everybody against each other okay whirlpool samsung bosch and like all these other companies right and make them all fight for the business because they're like okay there's a new community we're building here it's gonna be 500 homes you know and they can they can make them compete and then they could even take it if they want to take an entire region right imagine a home builder let's say you know pulte homes right Imagine they say, okay, you guys can have the contract for the entire region, but what sort of pricing can you get? We want all these sorts of ovens. We want all these sorts of refrigerators, right? You got to come in and be very competitive there because the differences could be millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars, or you know, probably millions or tens of millions of dollars, right? And if one company now competes the other company, you lose that business. So you got to kind of you got to kind of eat your margin in the short term so you get that business. So that's kind of my thought process in regards to that. And also, home builder numbers, although they're good, it's not necessarily that the home builders are just building a ton of homes right now. It's more like the home builders are making bank because home prices are so expensive that people go to the home builders to go build a home, right? Because inventory is really low. And these home builders 
can really charge a lot of what they want to charge. And so it's really a margin story for a lot of the home builders and profitability story more than a revenue story. Wind Resorts, I spoke about that one earlier, Starbucks. So, Starbucks. This one's been hit very hard. Look at this. I mean, it's nearly at those lows, 87? 87 Starbucks it's down to? I mean, holy smoke, this is no joke. So in the Rona crash, it got into the 50s, right? But obviously, it's not a very realistic situation, but got in the 50s. Then in the big stock market crash we had in 2022, it got into the 70s, right? $71 or so. But here we are with the stock market near all-time highs, and then Starbucks at 87 bucks. Now, there's something I talked about many years ago in regards to Starbucks that was very negative, right? And I got laughed at at that time. People laughed at me. This is years ago now. And they said, aha, Jeremy, I don't know what you're talking about, this and that, okay? And the thing I talked about years ago that has started to play out and come to fruition in regards to Starbucks is I spoke about competition. And years ago, I talked about a company named Dutch Bros. And I talked about how we were starting to see that on the West Coast, and now that could be a major competitive threat with all the other small coffee shops that were opening up and things like that. And this is like, you know, probably four, five, six years ago I made that video, right? People laughed at me. Oh, uh, now it's starting to come to fruition. Now you're starting to see Dutch Bros expand rapidly. And at the end of the day, Dutch Bros can help create a bigger market, right? But it also is at least somewhat of a competitive threat. I know of so many Dutch Bros in Arizona or in Vegas that are basically right across the street from a Starbucks. And so there I am, and let's say I want a Frappuccino type product. I can go to Dutch Bros or I can go to Starbucks, right? And so boom, there's the competition. And it's like, I could go there, could go there. It's tough. It also puts competitive, obviously it puts, um, you know, it puts kind of a cap on also how much you can charge. Cause let's say Starbucks is like, we want to go up a dollar on all our drinks. You can do that. But the consumer might then look at Dutch Bros as a good value. So they might also like the product better, but then they also say, this is also a better value. And so Dutch Bros steals that business away, right? And Dutch does a lot of business. I mean, if you ever go to Dutch Bros, like usually the line's out the door. So that's the one negative thing. But with that being said, Starbucks is Starbucks. They put up great numbers, insanely profitable, good balance sheet in the company, right? So I don't know. I'm considering it. We'll see where the stock goes. I kind of wish the whole market was getting hit right now because if the whole market was getting hit with Starbucks performing this horrible, this stock might be in the 60s right now. The only reason that stock's in the 80s instead of the 60s is really because we're in a strong stock market right now. That's just a little food for thought in regards to that. So I don't know, man. And like I said, it's, it goes way beyond just Dutch Bros. There's been so many small coffee shops that have opened up just in my city, Vegas. I mean, I have, let's see, one, two, one, two, three. I have three mom and pop type coffee shops that I would say compete with Starbucks that are closer to me than the closest Starbucks. And then the Starbucks by me has a Dutch Bros almost right across the street, right? So there's four serious competitive threats for that Starbucks that's the closest Starbucks to me. Four, three mom and pop coffee shops and Dutch Bros, right? Who do you go to? Who do you go to? So anyways, I'm still considering Starbucks. It might be a move I make here eventually. I spoke about Cake. I spoke about Avant. I spoke about Mattel. S-Q-Q-Q. -Q -Q. So this is an inverse uh, ETF on the NASDAQ, right? On the Qs. It's 3x leverage on a daily basis. It's a hedge I have on at the moment. I might add more to it. And the reason being is it's, it's insurance. It's insurance. It's as simple as that. It's insurance for my portfolio. It's no different than car insurance. It's no different than homeowner's insurance, life insurance, um, health insurance, those sorts of things. It's the way I view it, right? And so this is one of those situations that hypothetically, if the market got hit hard at any point, let's say the recession, I don't know what happens, okay? Let's say AI growth goes away or whatever, okay? Obviously, SQQ will go up rapidly and it'll go up in a very quick fashion, right? And obviously, if you're an SQQ over the long term, it's going to nothing, right? <laughs> like, this is where it's going. But in these time periods, when the market all of a sudden tanks for whatever reason, I mean, it can increase rapidly. If we look here at 7,000 to over 10,000. In a very quick amount of time, 
in 2015, 2016. And there wasn't even some big crash we had. There was a tough market there for a little bit in the short term, but that was not an epic crash. And look at how much it went up there, right? Um, if we go back to, this was pretty epic from what I remember. This was the late 2018 crash we had in the market. You know, this baby went from 1100 to nearly 2000 in a matter of, you know, we can call it four months, four or five months. In a matter of like four months, it went from 1100 to 2000, you know, you nearly doubled up your money, right? We can call it like an 80% gain, 85% gain in months. And so that's what can happen in a very tough market. Obviously the Rona crash was pretty crazy. Um, you know, in the short term there, we went from, let's call it 400 up to 729 there. And that happened in like a month, right? And, and that wasn't even peak to trough either because this doesn't have every single, you know, bottom and things like that. But anyways, the moral of the story is it's insurance, it's protection. And if the market gets hit hard in the short term, Q's jump, you know, obviously drops substantially. SQQQ goes flying to the moon. And, uh, yeah, not something you want to be in long term because you're just going to get absolutely decimated. You'll lose every penny. But it's it's insurance. If you buy car insurance, you don't say, ah, waste all my money. I didn't get in an accident this month. No. You're like, good. I didn't want to get in an accident this month, right? So that's the way with me. With my portfolios, I'm like, it's there in case I need it. And in those times you need it, you really need it. You really need that insurance, right? If the market tanks at any point and we have a 30% drop, I'm going to be happy with that SQQ because all my stocks are going to go like this, straight down. And SQQ is going to go to the moon because remember, it's 3x leverage on a daily basis, right? So that's that. Not something you want to hold long term though. Hood. Hood's intrigued me, but the problem with Hood is it's gone up so much that it's not as interesting to me. The great thing with Hood, obviously, they're a brand name, obviously, they're so well known in the investment community. Obviously, great balance sheet on the company, right? And obviously, they benefited from Bitcoin moving so huge. But the problem is, it's moved so much now that it's not nearly as compelling. So, Hood no longer interests me. And Netflix really doesn't interest me anymore either at this point in time. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this beast of a video here today. I appreciate y'all joining me for this beast. Holy smoke, is this was no joke because this is like an hour long video. Let me know in the comments if you made it all the way to the end and you enjoyed this video here today, folks. Appreciate y'all. Pin comment down there. We are five days away from the massive one day sale. You get access to that Patreon tier that's usually 125 bucks for $69 for that one day and one day only. Access to see the moves I'm making each week access to my number one stock market course ever that teaches you everything I know up here, as well as access to that Patreon Discord chat. Much love and have a great day.